Washington Journal continues. Our first guest of the morning is Myron Ebel with Competitive Enterprise Institute. He serves as the director for the Center for Energy and the Environment, here to talk about the recent decision by the White House on the Paris Climate Agreement. Good morning. Good morning, Pedro. A little bit about your organization first. Uh, how would you describe yourselves to others and what you do? We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit public policy institute that works on uh, issues from a free market perspective, and we concentrate on regulations. We accept no government funding, and our annual budget is getting close to $8 million a year. Who, who funds that budget? Uh, several thousand individuals, charitable foundations, uh, and uh, a few corporations. Yeah, so is, it a, is any of those corporations or individuals tied to the energy industry at all? Uh, we have uh, a policy not to disclose who our donors are. If our donors want to disclose that that they're contributing to us, then that's fine. But in, in the markets that you do receive money from, uh, if, if, if not from the energy, what other areas in a broad sense do you receive money from? Uh, a very broad spectrum of, of individuals uh, across the country and in fact around the world. Hey, what was your uh, organization's positioning on the Paris Climate Agreement and the President's decision to move out of it? Uh, we have uh, pushed since the uh, Paris Agreement came over the horizon that it needed, it, it was a treaty, it was going to be a treaty from day one, but they were describing it as not a treaty, just an executive agreement. Our position has been that the president's acceptance of the treaty, sending a letter saying, I accept it, we're now a member, was invalid because every other country in the world went through its normal legal and constitutional procedures. Virtually every other country called it ratification. Uh, for example, uh, Japan called it acceptance, but then they accepted the Kyoto Protocol and they accepted the underlying treaty, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So our view starting in, in 2015 is that the Senate needs to take this up and have a vote on it. Uh, and so what we've seen now is that what can be done by executive fiat by President Obama can be undone by executive fiat by President Trump. So I think, uh, you know, President Obama made a gamble that he could get away with this. It was likely that either a Democrat would be elected who would go along with it, or a Republican like George W. Bush who would say, well, if I just ignore it, it will go away. Uh, unfortunately for President Obama's gamble, uh, it failed uh, for him, unfortunately. And uh, President Trump has said, I'm going to undo this. Uh, so you were profiled by CNN recently, and this is the headline they applied to you and your organization. They said the man behind the decision to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Is that true? Well, no. Uh, President Trump made a, a number of campaign commitments during the, the campaign. And they're pretty clear. They're not based on long policy papers where you qualify everything and try to fudge the issue. He gave a number of policy speeches starting on May 26th of last year in Bismarck, North Dakota. And that was his energy and environment speech. And he said, I'm going to cancel the Paris Climate Agreement and I'm going to get rid of President Obama's climate agenda, which has all been implemented by regulation and uh, executive order and, and without Congress. So he promised that. So I think the, the key to the decision is that he's keeping his promises. And you put out, the organization put on an ad showing those promises from the president himself. And this was shortly before the decision was made. Yes, we did. And uh, that ad was really meant to remind the people in the White House and the president uh, how emphatic his promise was and how important it was. And as before the transition, even about the transition, you had a role when it came to the Environmental Protection Agency and the transition there, right? And I, what role was, did you serve? I was the leader of the EPA team. And so as far as that, did you gain access to the president and his advisors? And here's why I'm asking, is it previous, maybe that previous access you had, did you have any of that to directly tell the president, Steve Bannon, someone in the White House, basically nudging them or at least reminding them in a, in a, in a manner to pull out of this agreement? Uh, well, my work in the transition is uh, confidential, but I, but I can tell you that basically it was that the charge given to us by the transition leaders was figure out how to implement the president's campaign promises. Now, his campaign promises happen to be very close to the goals of the organization I work for, CEI, which is a, a deregulatory agenda on energy to try to get a, a large section of the economy going again. And in fact, that's what President Trump said. If we can get some of these obstacles to investment out of the way, we can get resource and manufacturing industries going in the heartland of America. 
So uh, yes, I, I know some of these people, and yes, I have talked to some of them, but I, until I went to the Rose Garden on Thursday to uh, uh, watch the President's uh, speech, I had never, in fact, seen him live before. So. So, but so, then, you could, so you could judge how far I am down the totem pole. But no <laughs> conversations with the key advisors as far as leading up to the lead out its, or the pull out itself and, and at least giving your thought on that. Well, I, what I would say is most of what we did to uh, try to influence the White House is, was public. Uh, my colleagues Chris Horner and Marla Lewis published a long, uh, very uh, detailed policy paper which went into the legal arguments very carefully. We did this television ad. Uh, we had a joint letter which uh, CEI organized, which was eventually signed by 44 uh, nonprofit groups, free market, conservative, and some science groups, that said, please, Mr. President, we support you in keeping your promise to withdraw from the Paris Climate Treaty. So most of, this, most of what we did was public, and, and I think that's where the, the, uh, what was effective. So here's the phone lines if you want to ask our guest questions. 202-748-8000 for Democrats, for Republicans, 202-748-8001. And for independence, 202-748-8002 on Twitter. You can respond at C-SPAN WJ from the regulatory standpoint that you take. What was wrong with the Paris Agreement? Uh, the Paris Agreement uh, is a, a, a promise by the United States to cut our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions, by 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by 2025. Now, the, the executive actions that and the regulatory actions that President Obama undertook without Congress would get us about halfway there. Now, President Trump is undoing most of those actions, and therefore we're a long ways away from meeting our commitment. The, the people who wanted us to stay in said, well, it's just voluntary. You don't have to do it. Well, first of all, it's a commitment of the United States. Uh, typically, international commitments can be litigated in uh, federal court by private citizens saying the United States is not living up to its commitments. The second thing is that the Paris Treaty, and it really is a treaty, is perpetual. Every five years, each party is supposed to make a new commitment. So uh, by staying in, if President Trump had stayed in, I think he would have really been pursuing the failed policy of George W. Bush, which was, if I ignore it, it will go away. What happened was when President Bush went away and President Obama came in, everything that had just been sort of sitting there for eight years popped back to life. And if you recall, in the first year, in December of 2009 of President Obama's term, first term, we had the Copenhagen Accord, which uh, collapsed in Copenhagen. Uh, that, was, that was a big uh, event, which had just been lying they are ready to go during those eight years. I'd say the other thing that President Trump did is he made it very clear that the United States is not going to fund the Green Climate Fund. And that was, uh, that was agreed to, that was proposed by Secretary Clinton in 2009 in, in Copenhagen, and it was confirmed in 2010 in Cancun at the annual Global Warming Powwow. Now, uh, the Green Climate Fund is meant to raise a, a a minimum of $100 billion a year starting in 2020 from the developed countries to help the developing countries pay for the costs of reducing emissions and adapting to climate change. Uh, the Congress has made it clear they're not going to fund the Green Climate Fund. So President Trump wasn't breaking any new ground, but what he was doing was he was putting the developing countries on notice that the United States is not going to be transferring vast sums of money to the developing world to reduce emissions. So you guys in these countries that say you're supporting the Paris Treaty, you better think twice because, in fact, many of them are in it because they think there's, there's a lot of money involved. Myron Ebel, our guest from Competitive Enterprise Institute, joining us. Our first call for you comes from Baltimore. This is on our independent line. M Nat, good morning. You're on. Hello. Uh, thanks for C-SPAN. I'm so glad I got on with uh, uh, Mr. Ebel. First of all, let me give you my uh, uh, justification. I ran three orbital geophysical observatory satellites, OGO, orbital geophysical observatory, POGO, polar orbiting geophysical observatory, and EOGO, earth orbiting geophysical observatory. We measured all surface temperatures because every 45 minutes they all made a complete uh, circuit. 
we could find no, zero, anthropogenic, man-made influence upon the changing climate, which is absolutely necessary and natural. What I would hope is that people that question the ones who are so wildly uh, enthusiastic about who are killing the world, ask them to distinguish between man-made and natural. We've always had climate change. Now, as far as the Paris Agreement, that goes back to another thing for making money by creating a new class of brokers. They will trade your ability to uh, reduce CO2 by somebody else's ability, and they make the money in the interim. Okay, Nat, we'll let our guests respond. Uh, Nat is, uh, let me start with the, with the broker, broker comment. Uh, if you look at the most enthusiastic supporters of uh, action to reduce emissions and these international agreements, you find companies uh, back at the time of Kyoto like Enron and more recently Goldman Sachs. And of course, Henry Paulson, the head of Goldman Sachs, became the Treasury Secretary in the last couple of years of the George W. Bush administration. And he created a whole unit at uh, Treasury to develop the perfect trading system, the perfect carbon tax, and that kind of thing. Because Goldman Sachs, as a broker, will be in the middle of every deal and will get a commission. And now we have Gary Cohn at the White House, uh, former head of Goldman Sachs, who, again, it was reported, was a supporter of us staying in the Paris Climate Treaty. It seems to me uh, I'm often accused of representing economic interests when, in fact, I, I think I'm representing uh, consumers' interests. But uh, there, is a, there is an obvious conflict of interest for people who come out of uh, organizations like Goldman Sachs. Now, as for the, as for the satellite measurements, I, I defer to, to Nat. Uh, this is John from New Mexico, Republican Line. Hello, and thank you for taking my call, Pedro. It's always great to talk to you. Um, I, I would just like to mention that the IFCC report was wrong. They had us study that IFCC report at the university some 10 years ago. And, you know, I'm telling you that the 777 climate change concert and thing that uh, Al Gore did, the whole documentary that Al Gore did, uh, it was wrong, okay? None of that has come to pass. Many scientists have jumped back from climate change and said, well, maybe it was a perturbation, just a perturbation over time in, in climate. But what we have done here is we have elected a president, and part of his platform was not to pay the world $26 billion in blackmail over climate. And we built this big industry of people that fund you. Myron, you're funded by solar panel manufacturers, people that make cars like Musk. You know, you're financed by interest, corporate interests that make a lot of money off of this climate change rhetoric. And, yes, it's the climate changes. It's generally because God decided it's time for the climate to change. Now, you're going to say I'm an idiot because I'm invoking the name of God. But we elected a president that was going to throw all this hogwash aside, and that was a big part of his agenda, is not to be blackmailed by other countries. All right, Please. caller, we'll let our guests respond. Well, uh, John, I think uh, you have me confused with the other side. I support President Trump's decision, and one of the reasons I do is something President Trump didn't talk about, which is uh, global warming as a hypothesis that uh, as we increase our uh, emissions from burning coal, oil, and natural gas, which produce carbon dioxide, that that will lead to warming. Well, I, d I don't think there's any uh, doubt about that in theory. The question is how much warming. Uh, and uh, what we found is that the model predictions from the 1980s and the 1990s have far over predicted. They, have, they, they predicted a lot more warming than we've seen. So I think that really this hypothesis has been disproved. And what we need to do is to look at the data. The data show a very mild, modest rate of warming. Uh, the, the side effects or the impacts of that warming are mostly beneficial. Some are negative. It depends on where you are in the world and kind of what your preference is. I mean, some people like cold weather, and 
Some people would like to be in a slightly warmer climate, say North Dakota in the winter. If it were five degrees warmer, it might be nicer. But I think, uh, by and large, the hypothesis that is still being pushed by the alarmist community uh, has been disproved by uh, history, the data that we've accumulated since the 1980s. Uh, Democrats line, Melvin, you're next up. Good morning. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I'd like to talk to uh, Myron there. Uh, when he first came on, he very nicely said he's not taking no side about anything. And But then in the same statement, he very clearly uh, denounced President Obama. And it seems like he's just another link in the chain that's trying to correct the mistakes that uh, President Trump made. So... In my opinion, all this is is just another part of the conspiracy to dismantle everything that President Obama did. You can if you want to, but you compare the difference between the smartness of the two guys, and you know Trump is a dummy. I say lock him up, lock him up. Melvin, him Melvin, up. <laughs> Melvin, what do you think about the value of the Paris Agreement? What do you think, uh, if it was done on the previous president, what do you think of the value it brings? I think we should stay in it because... We're better together. It don't have to be just the U.S. I've got sons and grandsons in the military, and it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. It, it, we need these people. My son, when he went to uh, Iraq, he had to stop off in Germany. He had to stop in all these places, that, you know, for for exchange, so they can change planes and all that. He can be killed while he's waiting. So you got to be careful how you alienate all these things. Gotcha, Melvin. So what do you think about now the other countries that are left? in this agreement if the U.S. decides to pull it? Is this a sovereignty issue of them taking charge of an issue like climate change? Well, a couple of comments to Melvin. Uh, first, let me go back to this idea that President Trump is undoing everything that President Obama did. Well, I think you see uh, that a lot of what President Trump did was based on the fact that his agenda was frustrated in Congress. In 2000. When he was elected, he did not run in 2008 on, global, on a global warming agenda. He barely mentioned it. Neither did his opponent. Now, as soon as he got in, he said, we need cap and trade legislation to control emissions. Fine. Uh, that's the kind of fight that we need in this country, the political debate. Congress debated it. The House passed it very narrowly. The blowback from the country was so strong that the Senate never took it up. Harry Reid said, no, we're not going to touch it. And in the 2010 election, many Democrats lost because of that vote, and the Republicans took over the House. Now, in 2010, right after the election, the president said, well, there are more ways to skin the cat. I don't need Congress. I can do it through executive orders and regulations based on existing laws. That hasn't worked, because what happened is that what can be done by executive action can be undone by executive action, and that's what's happening. So if you don't like what President Trump is doing, I think what you have to say is he, he picked the wrong path. He should have persisted with Congress, maybe not gotten as much as he wanted done, but maybe much more modest legislation. But once something is passed into law, it's much more difficult to get rid of it than some executive order or regulatory action. So I think President Trump uh, is is perfectly within his rights. He won the election just as President Obama won the election uh, four years ago and eight years ago. Now, as far as other countries, uh, I think the, the, the uh, hysteria around the world over President Trump's uh, agenda is not altogether sincere. Because on the one hand, we've been told that the Paris Climate Treaty is the most important agreement in the history of the world. And on the other hand, environmentalists included have said, well, it's, it's really no big deal. Uh, it doesn't do that much. Uh, for example, the United States commits to real emissions reductions, but those are swamped by the increases in emissions that China has promised, that India has promised, and that other major developing countries have promised. So the total global emissions, if, if Paris was totally implemented, if everybody kept their promise, would would hardly be affected. Now, our emissions would be affected, Europe's emissions, Japan's, but uh, China's, uh, China has promised that their emissions will keep going up until 2030. And remember, Chinese emissions went, surpassed U.S. emissions in 2006, and they're now almost double U.S. emissions. Let's go to our independent line from Michigan. Mark, go ahead. 
Yes, sir. I think I think our system has has it on the wrong level. I'm trying to figure out why what who stole the TV tube technology. I want to take take the Tesla static machine, throw it in the north and south pole, use the TV tube technology, dispense that TV tube energy into the electric grid. But if you take that heating, if the static electricity from the aurora borealis is actually heating the north and south pole. You take that, dim that light, that might allow the North and South Pole to rejuvenate and recool themselves. Dan, up next, from Washington, D.C., Republican Line. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Pedro, for taking my call. Uh, I just want to point out, uh, sort of building on your, your guest comments uh, before the last caller, that Democrats were very opposed to the Paris Agreement President Obama did not get it uh, approved by Congress. He rammed it through. And Democrats said it was uh, voluntary. They were not supportive of it until President Trump decided to say the U.S. was going to take a leadership role outside of the Paris Agreement. And then everybody on the other side said, oh, my God, he's going to kill the planet, you know, Armageddon, everything's going to uh, blow up. I just think it's very ironic and want to point that out to the viewers. Thank you. Mr. Ebo. Well, let me comment on the previous caller for just a minute. I, I believe in technological innovation. I believe that uh, the world is going to uh, innovate new technologies that we, uh, that, uh, particularly me, who uh, am not uh, technologically capable, uh, can dream of. But I, I don't think we can predict it. And I, I think where te technological innovation comes is from free markets, free people, responding to the incentives provided by free markets. That's why the United States is a lot more innovative than a lot of, than every other country in the world, because we are the freest. Now, the idea, I want to point out this idea that we, we can cool down the Arctic and the Antarctic. Antarctica has been cooling down. Contrary to the headlines, uh, the temperatures uh, over the last several decades have gone down slightly in Antarctica. They've gone up slightly in the Arctic. So I don't think that's either way is an argument for or against global warming. Your, your uh, more recent caller, I think Dan, let me uh, say to him, uh, yes, this, the problem is that the debate has been uh, moved to wherever the, the alarmist camp, the supporters of Paris, think they can make some progress. So uh, when, it was in, when, when it was first negotiated, it didn't go nearly far enough. Uh, it, it was entirely voluntary, nothing to worry about. Uh, then it became the most important environmental agreement in the history of the world, and President Trump is somehow turning his back on that and is a traitor to the planet. So you've you got to decide which side you're on here, whether it's, a, it's really a nothing or whether it's just absolutely critical. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to get involved in that. I'm just opposed to it. Uh, the editorial board of the Chicago Tribune on their criticisms of the president's decision said this, saying that Mr. Trump's stubborn approach represents a squandered opportunity to assert American influence, ceding the conversation to Europe and China. This puts the U.S. on the sidelines for one of the most important issues of our time. That's a risky place to be. It's also a deeply puzzling position for a president so focused on business. A lot of these conversations will be about the future of green energy, meaning solar, wind, and other technologies at which the U.S. excels. Uh, two points. Uh, first of all, I think that when you're going in the wrong, excuse me, I think that when you're going in the wrong direction, uh, you're not leading. So I think the United States under President Trump has a tremendous opportunity to, to lead the world to a, a future of more abundant and more affordable energy. Uh, that leads to my second point. 80% of the world's energy comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. The demand is going up every year, uh, often about 2%. If you look at renewable energy, windmills and solar panels, together after all these decades of subsidies and mandates and all the government action to force, pe force utilities to, to increase power rates in order to pay for windmills and solar panels, they supply less than 1% of the world's energy. So uh, this is not the future. Windmills and solar panels are a dead end. If you want to talk about the technological innovation that will uh, get us off coal, oil, and gas eventually, it's either going to be nuclear power, which many of the environmentalists say, uh, the, you know, the planet is, is, is threatened, we'll do anything, except we won't allow nuclear power. 
Uh, that's, uh, you know, there's a contradiction in their thinking here. Mm -hmm. If this is a truly a crisis, then we have to do whatever is necessary. Uh, or some technology that we have not dreamed of yet. And for example, the shale oil and gas revolution was not something that government dreamed up. It was something that private individuals like George Mitchell down in Texas spent decades tinkering with until he made it work. And that is the biggest energy revolution uh, in our lifetimes. So uh, that's the kind of thing that we can't predict. Nobody thought he could do it, but he did it. And so uh, I, I believe in, in the future, but I don't think the future is windmills and solar panels. Our guest is Myron Ebo of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. You heard him talk about uh, heading the Mr. Trump CPA transition team, uh, about degrees in philosophy and political theory uh, in education, talking about uh, issues concerning the Paris Agreement and uh, the president's decision to pull the U.S. out of that. From Icebam in North Carolina, Democrats line. Hi there. How you doing? This is Vernon Ice from Icebam from North Carolina, from Icebam.com. 63 million people voted for Donald Trump. So Donald Trump going to do something for 63 million people and nobody else. So out of those 63 million people, most of them probably just like me, that don't know a whole lot about the science behind climate change, but I do know that we're probably leaving some type of carbon footprint. Now, the problem is that how much we're going to get charged by the world globally for this carbon footprint is the issue. I'm, I'm taking it. So, therefore, some people are saying we shouldn't be charged nothing and we shouldn't even care about the debate about it because nobody's going to play fair. That's fine. Y'all can debate about all that y'all want because the problem with me is that until we really study the science about, really, is until we really study, I don't think Donald Trump really had the IQ to really study the science behind global warming the way that everybody think he do, but that's fine. But stop using President Obama because he's not president no more. And to me, it seems kind of racist every time y'all say Obamacare and every time y'all keep using Obama, every time y'all want to say something about Donald Trump. He's the president now. Stop blaming President Obama. Like I said about President Bush when Obama came, they gave President Obama one month. Y'all said, stop using Bush. At least stop using Bush. Y'all just stop using Bush. But okay. Obama, I keep using Obama all the time. Caller, you made your point. Well, uh, unfortunately, in politics, we, we have to look back and see what's been done and what needs to be done. And so uh, I personally am going to keep blaming the Obama administration for the things that I think they did wrong and uh, supporting them for the things I think they did right. Uh, it, but in my case, I think they did a lot more things wrong that I disagree with than they did right. So, uh, and I think your caller has the opposite view. So I think, but I think what we need to do is to be respectful of uh, President Obama. He, uh, he was uh, president and he tried to lead the country in the direction he thought was right. I, I disagree with that, but I don't, I don't try to, to trash him or, 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 or denigrate him. Uh, we'll hear next on our independent line from Lexington, Kentucky. This is Christian. Yes, hello. Um, withdrawing from the uh, Paris Accord is the most short-sighted uh, decision that uh, President, the mafia leech in Trump, uh, the mafia leech in Chief Trump could have ever have done. Um, here in Kentucky, we have the most lung cancer deaths. We have the most food river in the United States. After California, we're tops for worst polluted air. We have the worst children's ADHD rates in the states. We have the most um, black lung minors, which, by the way, Big Coal bribed John Hopkins University to deny just about every single case of black lung disease. And now they shut down that unit and they're under a class action lawsuit. Uh, Mr. Myron Ebel, according to the Truth Tobacco Industry documents, housed at the University of California um, is, is one of the tobacco lobbyists who lobbied Congress through the frontiers of freedom uh, lobby group to allow advertising of cigarettes to kids. And he's taking a page out of that playbook and doing the same thing with cancery coal there are over 300 high hazard coal ash dams in the United States, any one of which would ruin a state's drinking water. Okay, Christian, we'll let, we'll let the guest respond. Uh, Christian is uh, misinformed, and I don't blame him. I blame uh, the left-wing uh, demonization campaign that hides behind uh, academic credentials and studies. Uh, I did work, I'm proud to say I worked for Frontiers of Freedom, which was founded and chaired by former Senator Malcolm Wallop, one of the really great leaders, conservative leaders of our time. Uh, I never have never lobbied 
on a single tobacco issue. I've never even said anything about a single tobacco issue in public or really even in private. I don't, th these are not my issues. They're not what I'm concerned with. Uh, I think uh, when I've worked at CEI, CEI in fact uh, filed a, a lawsuit, which I, again I had nothing to do with, but it filed a lawsuit to try to overturn the master settlement agreement between the state attorneys general and the big tobacco companies on the grounds of collusion. And of course, the big tobacco companies oppose that uh, lawsuit. So if anything, I've been more against, uh, you know, by association, I've been more against big tobacco than I've been for it. But I've never, I've never lobbied in any way uh, for even a, a minute on any single issue related to, to tobacco. So. My, Myron Evo with Competitive Enterprise Institute joining us to talk about issues of climate change and the Paris Agreement. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pedro.